All right. Welcome, guys. Uh, thank you for clicking on the uh, Theofly podcast video. Um, today, I have a special guest with me, uh, Pastor John Carroll. I, I noticed that I have his full name, or he has he has put his full name, and I have just put just Luke. <laughs> so Luke and Pastor John Carroll. <laughs> Luke the <Bonner. laughs> Yes, yes. Uh, in fact, uh, Pastor Carroll, I'm just going to I'll call you John from now on. Yes, that's, that's okay. perfect. He has actually, um, you got to, I guess, got to watch me grow up. So he's a family friend. Uh, yes. So I actually remember him being involved with Bible quizzing when I was like 12 years old, like hanging out in the in my uncle's church. And so, uh, yeah, you've seen me grow up from just a little, well, I guess I was never really little, but um, <laughs> yeah. So uh yeah, my I wanted dad to bring... preaching for your grandpa before you were even near about thought of. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I wanted to bring him on today to talk about uh, a topic that we both think is really important. Um, with this, the topic of sola scriptura. Uh, it's something that we both believe sh should be foundational to um, the church that we that we all should adhere to it. And so uh, I want to actually kick it over to John so he can actually share with us kind of what uh, his understanding of Sola Scriptura is and then kind of give a definition of it. And then we'll move forward from there uh, and talking about the how it interacts with us you know, in the church. So there are um, some misunderstandings of Sola Scriptura, but the proper definition of it is that it is the church's sole infallible rule of faith uh, for Christian practice. And so it doesn't say that scripture is the sole rule or that it's the only rule or only authority. It doesn't deny the authority of the church. It doesn't deny uh, other sources of Christian authority. It just simply states that scripture is the sole infallible rule of faith. It's the sole infallible authority uh, in determining what is uh, prohibited or permitted for Christian practice. And uh, so, uh, in other words, what Sola Scriptura says is if there is a conflict between Scripture and tradition, if there is a conflict between Scripture and church history or anything of that nature, that that Scripture is the ultimate authority, that Scripture is the thing that stands above and judges every everything else in relationship to Christian practice. Yeah, very good. So it, um, it's not to say that we don't have um, a place to look at tradition or to look at what the early church has said or things like that. It's just to say that scripture is the only thing that's infallible that we can bind on, on the, the church. Yeah, on the conscience of believers. And so I, I don't know of any uh, adherent of Sola Scriptura uh, that doesn't respect church history, but I also don't know of any adherent of of uh, Sola Scriptura that doesn't say that there were church fathers that were wrong about at least individual doctrines. And when they say that the church fathers were wrong about uh, individual doctrines, then they, they place scripture above the fathers. Right. I think Hank Hennegraaff says something like, where the fathers stand with scripture, I stand with the fathers where the fathers depart from scripture, I depart from the fathers. Right. Right. So um, this holds that anymore since he converted. Oh yeah. Oh, I forgot about that. He's, he's Orthodox now, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. But yeah, so th this is a pretty, I mean, foundational for most Protestants. I think, I think most Protestants adhere to Sola Scriptura. There might be some who don't, but, but we're going to talk today about uh, our, my former tradition, we're going to talk about the uh, the apostolic movement and kind of how they interact with um, Sola Scriptura, which is not positive often. No, so, it usually is it. So go ahead and if you could t tell us uh, maybe a couple reasons why um, a lot of apostolic uh, preachers and pastors will reject Sola Scriptura. Well, uh as you've seen on some of my posts uh, on Facebook, when I've posted about Sola Scriptura, uh, oh, the apostolic, right. the uh, apostolics will um, 
come out guns blazing mm -hmm. uh, against Sola Scriptura. And there's a couple <clears throat> of primary reasons why. The first one is that they feel like that Sola Scriptura is inherently cessationist, mm -hmm. that it demands the uh, cessation of the gifts of the Spirit. So they think by adhering, adhering to Sola Scriptura, it does away with tongues, prophecy, uh, the, the gifts of the Spirit. And uh, to which I say, I, I, am, uh, I am a continuationist um, specifically because of Sola Scriptura. Right. I am a continuationist because uh, the Scripture teaches that the gifts will continue until the parousia or the parousia of Christ. Right. And 1 Corinthians 1, so that you come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so I believe the gifts endure until until the second coming because I adhere to Sola Scriptura. And there's right. nothing inherent in saying that the Scripture is the, the sole infallible rule of faith. Uh, right. There's nothing in that that's inherently contradictory to the gifts of the Spirit. I think every continuationist, Pentecostal, charismatic, however a person chooses to label themselves, understands that we judge tongues and prophecy and, and the gifts of the spirit right. differently than we judge scripture. Mm -hmm. We don't place them on par with one another. When a prophet prophesies, right. we judge that prophecy. We don't just accept that prophecy as, right. as infallible the, the way I do whenever I go to scripture. I have a presupposition with scripture that I don't have with prophecy and tongues, right. et cetera. Yeah, and it, I mean, like, why else would Paul tell us to test prophetic utterances if it wasn't the fact that they were not, they, that they were, like, that the prophet was fallible, right? So yeah. he's, not to say that that God's revelation is, is fallible, but that our interpretation of it and our speaking of it can be fallible. So we need to test yeah. it. We need to weigh the words, test the words. Um, and um, if, if that, if uh, prophecy does not, it does not have the same level of um, infallibility as it's not infallible like scripture, right? Okay. Scripture is the sole infallible. That's the key. That's what we're trying to, to hone in on is infallible. And, yeah. And, and prophecy isn't used to establish doctrine, right? Tongues and interpretation, prophecy, words of knowledge, wisdom, et cetera, aren't used to establish doctrine to where uh, after a utterance of the spirit that the, the, the Catholic global church has to be their conscience is bound to that for all right. time and eternity. So uh, we don't use prophecy, tongues and interpretation to establish doctrine right. within the church. And that's the, that's the sole role of sole infallible role of scriptures to establish uh, a doctrine in the church. Yeah. And I will just say quickly for some of the subscribers on this channel who might not understand what you just said, Catholic is small C Catholic, not yes. talking Roman Catholic. Yeah. Uh, small C Catholic, universal, like the church, you know, the the whole church. Um, yeah. So the first objection that you brought up is that they think Sola, Sola Scriptura is inherently cessationist, which is odd to me seeing as scripture affirms the gifts of the spirit. So, you know, that's a pretty easy okay. objection to to reject. So what, what would one, be the... There's one example of what you said earlier that prophets are uh, are fallible conduits of God's infallible word. Mm -hmm. I, heard a, I heard a story of a man that prophesied to this lady that uh, her baby was had a certain sickness or that there was be prophesied to her something about her baby. Well, come to find out this lady was holding a baby doll for her daughter and it wasn't our, and it wasn't even her, a baby, a real baby. Really? But the lady like down that same pew, the word that he gave to her was exactly wow. what that lady needed. His, hum yeah. his humanity saw that, that lady with that right. baby doll and thought it was thought it was the one that God gave him the word for the word was accurate. His humanity m messed up right. the person that it was for. Yeah. Uh, another quick example. Um, 
there's a, a guy that he tells a story um, of basically he, he was standing on the stage and, you know, they were doing public prophetic ministry and he was standing there and he had a word for a guy um, come to him saying, um, uh, yes, you will recover. Um, and that's what he, that's what he thought was the word. And so he interpreted it as a sickness. Yeah. Uh, have you, you've been, you've been sick, you've been something and the Lord says you will recover, but he didn't thankfully, because he understands that he doesn't fully grasp everything. He didn't share that. He actually said, sir, I hear the words you will recover. We'll come to find out later after the service, um, the guy comes up and says, I was literally asking this morning in prayer, standing over my my sink in the kitchen saying, Lord, will I ever recover from this divorce? Yeah. And so it so he had interpreted it as a sickness. Yes, you'll recover from sickness. But it wasn't that. But yes, he had been actually praying those words. Will I recover? And yeah. so it's just an example of like prophetic words. They come to us. They um, the revelation is infallible. It's God speaking. God never speaks incorrectly. But we, you know, sometimes in our humanity can can mistake what he's saying. And I mean, it's important. It's important for us to say what God says. Nothing right. else. Yes, exactly. Nothing, yeah, don't add to it. Clarify it for God. Just let God yes. speak. <laughs> well, and and it makes sense though. Like um, we do this with scripture too. Like yeah. pe people, like I don't know any person, even even a cessationist who you know who affirms solo scripture. I don't see any of them who would they, they would all admit that sometimes we read the text, we come to an interpretation, and our interpretation is wrong, and we later change that interpretation. Yeah. Well, we're we're fallible. God's word is infallible this whole time. It never like it was never wrong. We we yeah. get it wrong. So Interestingly, it's, many times the things that they're interpreting is prophecy too, and they right. get, they get their interpretation of prophecy wrong. <laughs> yes. Well, I could uh, I, I could go for hours dunking on cessationism, but that's not yeah. what the point of this this stream is. No. So let's move on to um, what what is the second objection that many apostolics have against sola scriptura? The big one that really sends them into. Um, strong emotional conflict is the issue of pastoral authority. They think that if you affirm sola scriptura, then you are taking out of the hands of the pastor, the authority to uh, preach, teach, uh, demand and bind whatever, whatever, what oneness Pentecostals call standards on their congregations. And uh, I, th I think probably the reason why they have such an adverse, such an adverse reaction to it is that's exactly what sola scriptura is limiting, right? It, exactly what it should be limiting. And I'll just give you one example from. I, I won't call his name. I'll be charitable, um, but um, one apostolic friend of mine uh, will say, "You may be able to go to heaven with facial hair, but you can't go to heaven from my church with facial hair." Right. And so he feels like as a, the pastor, he has the authority to set the conditions for whether or not a person can enter into heaven based upon an extra biblical right. rule or standard. Wow. So he has the authority for his congregation on whether or not they can enter heaven. That's yeah. just no person is is created to wield that authority. Yeah. And as a pastor, um, as a pastor, like I, I don't, I don't have that authority and I, I have no desire to even try to take that authority. That's a, that's a heavy burden to carry. That's a huge load to try to carry okay. to say that I have the authority as a man to, to, to place burdens on my congregation that are, uh, greater than God's authority uh, over their lives and that I can actually overrule God right. on who gets into his heaven based yeah. upon a rule that, and it, and it's an abuse of a, it's an abuse of a text, you know, obey them that have the rule over you mm -hmm. or they watch for your souls 
that right. they may do it with joy and not with grief. And um, I've often said that if your only verse you have to preach a standard is obey them that have the rule over you, it's not biblical. Right. Yeah. You know, I, uh, I don't, so I want to actually ask you though, do you think that this is widespread across the whole apostolic movement or are there, it is. Oh, yeah. Cause yeah. I, I didn't know if there are pockets of churches that were actually holding to at least, you know, scripture, but there, there are pockets that, I mean, like myself, I still consider myself one that's been a right. uh, So it's not like I'm speaking from with outside, outside the movement. So right. I, I'm speaking, identifying as an insider. And so, um, <clears throat> and so there are obviously pockets of those who strongly adhere to Sola Scriptura, but they are by far the minority. Mm -hmm. And, and as, as you've seen on posts that I've made on my Facebook page that, that, um, whenever I post about it, man, they come out, they come out of the woodwork and yeah. just, they, they get furious at the idea that somehow their their uh, authority as a pastor has been limited by by scripture mm -hmm. alone, and they absolutely detest that idea. Right. Yeah, that's that's it's really sad. And I I actually heard. Um, well, actually, I did. I wasn't. I was so young that I wasn't even able to understand what was being said. But but there was a message preached at my church in Tulsa. Uh, growing up, uh, I think the the title was your personal Deuteronomy, and the the idea was that pastor has claimed if if I am wrong and I'm teaching something that's unbiblical, God will still honor you for honoring me. Yeah, um, by following what I teach, even if it's against what Scripture teaches. So obey me, not Scripture. Yeah, I've Basically. I've heard yeah I've heard something very similar my whole life that that the man of God is right even when he's wrong he's right and and I've heard I've heard it said that the reason w that God will actually allow the man of God to be wrong at times in your life in order to test your submission wow wow. That, that is, and that's crazy, man. Not very Berean. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Not very Berean. No. They were noble in that they searched the scriptures daily, whether the things right. that the apostles preached were, were so, and Paul commended them for. Yeah. For checking what they, and, you know, it, the, the common sentiment is, is in, in one of those Pentecostal circles is you just obey the pastor. Right. End of story. And, and the list of things that you have to do to come in compliance with the pastor is just right. Depending on the local church can be just insane. And I know, I know um, I preach Sunday about rest for your souls. And I preach from Matthew about Jesus saying, you know, take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy. My burden's light. If you come to me, I'll, I'll give you rest for your souls. And he was doing it in the, in the context of the heavy burdens that the Pharisees right. laid upon the people um, that they themselves wouldn't touch with one of their little fingers. Right. And just the idea of, of just, the goalpost constantly being moved, never being able to measure up. Once you start praying an hour a day, the goalpost gets moved to two hours a day. And once you, once you get past that, then right. you're having to come to the church and pray and you have to, you have to sign in with your name and the time that you signed in and the time yeah. you signed out. And, and then that gets taken to the pastor's office. And, and uh, based upon how much you prayed, it determines whether or not you can play music on the platform or whether or not you can be preach or, right. and, and, you know, I've often chuckled because, um, you know, the story of the young rich ruler where Jesus said, you're not far from the kingdom. Mm -hmm. I joke with people that I was one eighth of an inch from the kingdom <laughs> one time in my life because of, uh, one of my pastors, former pastors, um, uh, came up to me and looked at the side of my head and like, just looked right. at it really close and, 
and told me I needed to shave my sideburns by an eighth of an inch. They were looking. Wow. Were long. Yeah. He's and that was keeping head. you out of the kingdom. <laughs> yeah. I was an eighth of an inch from the kingdom. So I was probably a little, even a little closer than the young rich ruler. I was only an eighth of an inch from the kingdom. Right. Yeah. I've, and you know, I've heard some, some standards as they're called. Um, I've heard them, man, some crazy ones that, d that don't really make a lot of sense. So like you see a lot of it across the board in the movement. Some churches uh, won't allow you to wear, you know, the heck. <laughs> yeah. You disappeared. You, you're talking about some of them won't let you wear. Yeah. Sleeves down. Like you have to have sleeves down to your wrist. I'll have to go in and, and That's edit that, that out. <laughs> it is be fine. But yeah. Um, yeah, some churches you have to have sleeves down to your wrist, or else you know. I heard a you, pastor say one time, "No Christian, quarter Christian, <laughs> half Christian, three right. quarter Christian, full Christian." Whoa! <laughs> yeah, I remember most of my life just to, in order to fit in, because you know there's such a variety among churches. Most of my life, my parents just said, "Hey, just make sure that your sleeves, just if you're going to wear short elbow. sleeves, just below your elbow. That way, you know." And most most of the churches would accept that. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, and then you have some churches would be, um, I heard one church, all of the men, you couldn't wear a colored shirt. You had to wear a white shirt. Yeah. And it's like, where did that come from? That's, that's not, I don't know why, but that's a rule for their church. Yeah. Uh, wearing white shirts. Um, and, was, and, and the problem with it is, and I know probably pretty much everybody has some kind of, like tradition in their church, local tradition. And that's the other thing is that Sola Scriptura doesn't remove tradition. It mm -hmm. doesn't say tradition isn't allowed. Right. What it says is that tradition isn't infallible and that tradition right. has been binding upon the conscience of a believer. The problem with these standards in most places is that if someone in the local congregation decides they don't want to, to do it, mm -hmm. it puts them out in rebellion mm. against the pastor and therefore rebellion against God. Right. Because the pastor stands in the place of God. He, he is the voice of God. He's the man of God. He stands in the place of God. And once you decide that one of these extra biblical rules that you don't want to live for you or your family, it's not just, okay, this is secondary. This is not a part of the gospel. Therefore you have freedom to do or right. not to do. It's that now you're in rebellion against God and you are placed outside of fellowship. Right. And to be you, you're placed outside of outside of fellowship with the local church or in the case of an organization, you're placed outside of fellowship with the organization. And uh, you are you are alienated from from that from that mm -hmm. local church or from that organizational body. You won't be used and you won't be used to preach. You won't be used in music. You won't be used in Sunday school. If you choose not to adhere to every single extra biblical rule that is preached from the pulpit, then then best you can do is sit on the pew. Right. Wow. Yeah. And, and that's almost like a. Um... I don't know. I want to be charitable throughout the whole conversation, but it's almost like a really extreme, like papal authority. Like it's putting the man yeah. of God, the like the, 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 the uh, like he's standing in the place of God. Like he actually has, like, he's now the judge. <laughs> yeah. It's well, it's, it is a very, very uh, close association with papal infallibility. As we said earlier, the man of God is always right. Even when he's, wrong he's right right so there there is that air of infallibility that the pastor can't the pastor's never wrong right uh, that that no matter what you submit to that man of god and if you submit god like you said he the the one preacher taught right. you god will honor you for right. obeying the man of god even if the man of god is is wrong so there right. is that air of papal infallibility that exists in many I say many, not all, but in many apostolic churches, there is that that air of infallibility. Yeah. Uh, I remember when I first started making videos, uh, 
kind of documenting sort of my journey because I'm, you know, I'm no longer in the apostolic movement, but I, you know, I started making videos just kind of explaining some of my reasoning. And uh, one of the comments on one of my videos was, it, this was verbatim. He, he basically said, um, be, this happened because there was no prayer and honoring of the man of God. Yeah. Talking basically is like, this happened because you didn't honor the man of God and you didn't pray. And I was like, that's could to be, <laughs> couldn't be further from the truth. Like, well, number one, my adherence isn't to the man of God over scripture. Scripture mm -hmm. is what I adhere to. And then secondly, I was very prayerful with my, my journey because I found what I believe that I think scripture was teaching. I was yeah. never going to adhere to what a man said over what the scripture teaches. And I think that that's where the problem in the whole movement, it, it filters all the way down, even to the pew. They really believe that they have to follow what the pastor says. Yeah. Yeah, even even to the point to where if there's a conflict between pastoral authority and scripture, then pastoral authority stands over scriptural authority. Right. And they may deny that, but it's 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 absolutely the case when you watch it play right. out in in and, and many of them won't even deny it. They'll just come right out and say, Yes, we right. obey the man of God. I know that's they will say, I know that's not in the Bible. Right. We know that's not what the Bible teaches, but this is what we are going to to demand that you do to the point that you are excluded from fellowship with the body if you don't. Right. And, and yeah. th just the uh, theological implications of placing someone outside the body, mm -hmm. placing someone in outside of fellowship. Like, what are the theological implications of saying to someone that you are not in fellowship? Hmm. That's not that's not a small matter. That's not an right. ins insignificant matter to say to someone. Um, you're not welcome at at the table. You're not welcome right. at the Lord's Supper. You're not welcome in in fellowship to participate fully in in the in the body of Christ and in the, right. in the worship of the church that's a serious statement to make to someone mm -hmm. to say that you're not in fellowship it's it's not small it's not insignificant it's a strong theological statement to say right. you're not in fellowship and we put people outside of fellowship often over things that right that are not even secondary they're tertiary or even if it's possible right. to be further down the list than tertiary it's yeah. it's, I it's mean, we way down the list i heard a pastor once say that the women in this church can, couldn't wear braids um yeah because a braided hair represented this is hilarious represented the trinity because it was three <laughs> strands but i was like honestly Three and one, like, don't we yeah. all believe that? <laughs> so, everybody like, believes know. in uh, it's yeah, one brain. Even, even oneness <laughs> people have to believe in some kind of uh, yeah. dimensions, mul multiple dimensions of God's being. Like, yeah. Well, I actually think I actually think the braid is more oneness than it is trinitarian anyway, because it's of the same substance. It's the exactly. same hair. It's all the it's all the same. <laughs> There's no distinction in it. <laughs> so anyway, but so well, they gotta, uh, I guess they got to quit eating pretzels too. Except yeah, for the, the thick pretzels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yes. Anything that's three in one. Yeah, that's right. So I guess we can go ahead and wrap up the, uh, the stream here. Um, I guess give us, give us like a closing thought of why you think that uh solo scriptura is, something that, that apostolics need to take more seriously and maybe, uh, you know, just some closing well, thoughts. Yeah. We, I think, uh, apostolics need to take, uh, solo scripture more seriously because the casualties that have been left in the wake of abuse of pastoral authority is, is immense. There are, mm -hmm. there are so many people that, that have, um, uh, that are still suffering from, from uh, abuses that they at the hands of pastors and leaders mm -hmm. that they may not many of them may not ever step foot inside of another church again as a result of right. of of out of control pastoral uh, authority 
and a healthy a healthy view of sola scriptura would have would have limited those abuses would have brought those abuses into control into control mm -hmm. uh, and put place limits on them and so when a pastor has a healthy view of pastoral authority or i'm sorry well of pastoral authority as determined by sola scriptura right and it limits the the ways and the areas in which in which that pastor is going to exercise control over the lives of the people that are in his congregation that choose to worship under his leadership and um, i just think it's extremely important i'm um, uh, for for pastors to to have that healthy those healthy boundaries in where yeah. they where they because if you if you feel like you have full and complete oversight ownership and authority over over people in your congregation then the amount of abuses that you are willing to perpetrate if that's threatened is just mm -hmm. there's no limits right. and uh, yeah. I've seen it played out over and over and over and over again. Yeah. Or, you know, it and and the pastor becomes the the father to the family, the husband to the wife, mm -hmm. and completely circumvents the authority of the man in the home, which is a tragedy on every level. Right. And um, so yeah, it's 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 imp it's so very important that that right. we learn to rein that in and and limit our scope of authority to to the to the scriptures. Yeah. And, and I think even my my closing thought here would be just building off of what you just said. I, I study right now. I'm, I'm in an apologetics class where we study the cults and something that is common. And I'm not saying I'm not trying to make a statement that the apostolic movement is a cult. Yeah. However, however, in some of these churches, they are operating exactly like the cults operate, which is there is someone who is the figurehead who is basically controlling the people, the people in his congregation or his what, commune or whatever. And yeah. you see it happen all the time. He becomes the sole authority. He actually, like you just said, circumvents the authority of the man in the home. He takes their wives. And I'm not saying that apostolic pastors will do that, but it's not a far leap. No, it's not. So, and you know, the ultimate, the ultimate objective of a pastor is not to establish his own authority uh, within a church or a congregation. The ultimate um, responsibility of a pastor or a shepherd is to is to aid people in their relationship with Christ. Right. And at any point to which the focus of a pastor is to is to draw people to himself and to make right. to make him the focus of their, of their devotion and their and their uh church experience then it's idolatry right and um there's only there's only one one shepherd there's only um jesus is the uh jesus is the true ultimate shepherd the the right. shepherd and the bishop of our souls as as pastors and leaders we are under shepherds we are not the chief shepherd as peter calls him right. so so we actually we actually threaten and challenge the lordship of jesus whenever we become lords over god's heritage and let me just make this connection and i'll let you close that but as one of pentecostals those who emphasize str so strongly that there is only one lord mm. and the the emphasis of the shema in deuteronomy 6 and verse 4 here where's well, the lord our god uh, the lord is one mm -hmm. Like there sure are a lot of them who become lords over mm -hmm. God's heritage and challenge wow. the one lordship of Christ over his own flock. Come on. And good. so so it is a practical denial of the oneness of God. There's there's only there's only one Lord and I'm not him. Mm. That's good. That is really good. I want to uh, someone brought this to my attention the other day and it honestly convicted me on how little I've ever read Jude. <laughs> uh, but uh, in Jude, I think it's Jude verse 12. He's, he's talking about these like false, like uh, shepherds. And he says they are shepherds who only look after themselves. Yeah. 
And that like, and I think one translation puts it shepherds that feed themselves or something like that. And if like the job of the shepherd is to, you know, feed the flock, like to, from God's word, but these, these are shepherds that we're supposed to avoid and they're shepherds who look after themselves. The, and the, I feel like. Yeah, you know, absolutely. The rebuke against the shepherds in the old Testament is mm-hmm. one of the, one of the rebukes of the prophet was, is that they feed on the flock rather than feed the flock. Right. They, they actually use the flock as, yeah. as they they feed off of them or feed on the flock rather than feeding the flock. So, right. And I think uh, just as a closing, I would say to any pastor out there who is watching this, and maybe you're thinking, "Wow, that's actually something that I'm doing." Um, maybe I'm I'm actually trying to shape the church. Maybe you're not even doing it maliciously. Maybe you are just imposing rules that you think are good for your church and for your congregation, but you realize that you're actually shaping the church in your image and yeah. not the image of Christ. So I would just uh, ask you to take seriously what we've, what we've said here today. Um, not because we have any sort of power or anything like that, but I mean, the scripture, the scripture is what we need to have as our foundation for everything that we do. Yeah. So, hey man, my, my wife is trying to get a hold of me. So I got to. Absolutely. I can, I can end it right there where I just, Close it yeah. so I can in the broadcast now. Hey, thanks for joining me, man. Yeah, it was awesome. Sweet.